Welcome back to the program. Now, the wealth declaration discussion is back. And just like the mythical Pandora's box, the leakage on offshore accounts associated with leaders that include President Uhuru Kenyatta and 34 other world leaders has kicked up both a storm and a debate. In his preliminary reaction, the president has welcomed the leakage of the Pandora Papers as the beginning of a process that should promote transparency and openness on issues related to wealth. This global discussion is one that we want to delve into at this moment as we discuss transparency on wealth declaration and public officers with my guests uh, joining me both virtually and in studio. Joining me virtually is Transparency International Executive Director Sheila Masinde. Uh, thanks for staying with us. And here in studio, we have Francis Cairo, who's a policy officer, Tax Justice Network Africa, and Narok Senator Ledama Olekina. To my guests, once again, thank you for making time and, and staying with us. Senator, let me begin with you immediately with that question from a viewer. Actually, it's still on the screen. He wants you to distinguish between an offshore account and a foreign bank account. Do you see his I point? Think, uh, uh, in terms of a state officer, the Constitution is quite clear, Article 76. You cannot even own a, you know, a bank account. You cannot maintain and operate a bank account out of the country. If he wants me to distinguish between the two, if I'll distinguish it from a political perspective or from a state officer's perspective, you can't have any. You see, when you look at an offshore account, an offshore account can be one that you use to diversify your investments. You know, an account, if you have, let's say you have a student, you are a child who is going to school in America. Like in my case, my daughter is in the States. And you know, I have to make sure that she's got money to be able to, to, to use you whenever she needs. You have a complex needs. network of... You know? uh, I mean, uh, I, I'd just... love to have that one day. And I think there's nothing illegal about it in terms of owning property. Because you know, the problem we have in this country is that, it, it, not only in this country, worldwide, people really focus in what they're investing in, but not where they're investing in. I can tell you there are individuals in this country who owns bonds, mutual funds, but they never ask the question, where are they investing you know, their money? They are focusing in what they're investing in. But in most cases, it's not where. And you'll find that all that is invested offshore. In fact, when you raise the question of the president owning properties or the family owning properties, nothing prohibits. I mean, you have to show me the law that prohibits. In fact, Kenya as a country is really taking the right steps in ensuring that politicians locally do not uh, steal money and uh, have it being you know, invested for them through a nominee without the nominee dis you know, uh, s stating who the beneficiary are. So those are the steps that the companies act you know, put in place. And yet the president you know? himself in his response did state that offshore accounts have been used to launder money and carry out debt, you know, it, illegal it depends. transactions. Don't it you then depends. understand why think, Kenyans would respond? I think if you're looking at, let's say, the devolved government structure, and you can be able to attest that this person, you know, a few years ago before he became a state officer, the guy was broke. He was living in Pangani. But now all of a sudden, he's got billions of shillings. You know, and that money is not invested locally. It is invested abroad. So there, you can actually say those offshore accounts have been used to loan the money from Kenya abroad. Is that what you think is you happening know? in the counties? I, I think in the counties, yes. I believe in the counties that is what, that is, what is happening. Okay, I, and I, I'll come back to you for more. Uh, Francis, we still have you here, and Sheila will be coming to you shortly. Francis, I want to begin with you on the question that was posed by a viewer uh, anonymously, and we can go back to it. Uh, the, the complex web, yes, the, it, so it's not about, he says it's not about just the assets, but the manner in which these transactions are set up. You know, it's one thing to have a bank account. I imagine many of our athletes have bank accounts in New York, in, in, in London, and when they win a race, the money is deposited there. But I think this viewer wants to know more about what your network knows about when, when they set up of sort of very complex and, and secretive uh, bank accounts. What does that, uh, for what purposes? Help us understand how, those, uh, how that would work. Yeah, um, I think it is important to give the typology uh, of the kind of a, a discussion we are having here today um, and where people open bank accounts, offshore bank accounts. People do not just open offshore bank accounts anywhere. You don't just wake up and uh, go to any country and open an offshore bank account. There are several factors that those people consider. Number one is your ability to hide the secrecy 
that that country allows you to do that uh, opening of that account with. But secondly, it's also about the ability to hide from tax or the ability to evade tax. And therefore, the typology of, uh, the offshore, of, of these tax havens where people are opening these offshore accounts is places where the corporate tax rate is often lower than countries like Kenya. In addition to that, beneficial ownership laws in most of these countries are almost non-existent. You are not required to actually declare who you are. You are not actually required to furnish enough documents. In fact, in some of these countries, it is harder for you to get a library card than to open an offshore account. You are asked actually more questions or when you want to get a library card, for example, in the US, than when you want to um, uh, open an offshore bank account in some of those places. And I think this is the kind of shock that I am happy that people are having today. That the people named are the wealthy, the rich, and people who have a certain ability to manipulate the international financial system to their advantage, to hide their names, to operate behind nominees and complicated corporate structures, and to ensure that we're here today if we woke up and we were trying to get some of this world back into the country. There is no telling the kind of complexity legally that would portend for us. And I think these are the main, main issues that we need to address, that it is not just anyone that can wake up, go to any country, and open an offshore account. It is certain people who are well connected and, uh, and the people who know where to go, who to go to, who to speak to. You've actually As raised an, an interesting point that I want to bring Sheila back in on. When you talk about bringing wealth back to the country, yeah. Sheila, and I trust you can hear me, between 2016 and 2019, Wealthy Kenyans wired back to the country an estimated one trillion Kenya shillings from offshore accounts, uh, taking advantage of a tax amnesty that was offered by Treasury. They were not required to declare the source of their wealth or even account for previous year's tax arrears. We also know a think tank last year uh, announced that an estimated five trillion Kenya shillings is out of the country at this time. Why, why do you think this is so? Yeah, and maybe just to add that there was a whole debate and there's even an entire report done by the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Kenya just looking at the impact of um, that amnesty that was given, the tax amnesty of, is it 2018 or 2019? Uh, because there are concerns that it still uh, facilitated uh, capital flight, uh, but to the extent that people didn't have to disclose um, their sources of, of income that was then, you know, declared and, and repatriated. Uh, but then, then questions around then how, how was this, how are this, um, you know, how was this income generated, especially coming from some of these countries that have been highlighted, even in the, in the Pandora's papers and other leaks that have happened previously, like the Panama papers, the Paradise papers, and so on. But I think um, one of the other things that has been really concerning is just the, the state of beneficial ownership across the world. And um, if you look at some of the demands that have, have been made on the Financial Action Task Force, is that it really needs to implement and ensure that there are open central beneficial, beneficial uh, ownership registers across the world. Because even now it's a concerning that even in some of the countries um, that have been highlighted as tax havens, some of them have of course rushed to put in place beneficial ownership laws. Uh, but then there's a question of whether they're just doing that to tick the box or and, and to get out of that gray list in the financial action task force and then be cleared. Um, so there's, there's a lot of concern whether whatever we're happening in terms of uh, cleaning up and ensuring that this financial integrity across the world is really for the sake of just doing so or for the sake of ensuring that there's meaningful uh, reforms in terms of how we, we you know, manage our, the, the financial sector across the world. Okay. And Senator, okay. Let, me, let, me, let me come back to you on this. And the elephant in the room are the concerns about the relationship between offshore accounts and possibly official corruption. Let me refer you to a case study, one we covered actually a story one in our, in, in our bulletin today. The case of former Kenya Power boss uh, Samuel Gishuru, former finance minister Chris Okemo. We won't go into the details of that. It's still a live matter to some extent in court. But it's no secret that you are wanted in Jersey Island to face theft and money laundering charges. Don't you see, again, and I bring you back, to, that many Kenyans would want more clarity around how transparent it is to really monitor these offshore accounts 
at a time when in the past it has been on record that some Kenyans have used them for other uses beyond that which you are tabling uh, for us today. <laughs> Paying school fees for you children, know, it, it's, no, it seems no, more I'll than be, that. I like the fact that you're talking about bringing money back and also looking at that case study that you've just shared with us here. If there is a case where people have, are laundering money or they are obtaining money and you know, sending that money offshore, that is a case that I would support. But for me, the key to any modern investment strategy is diversification. And there are so many goodies abroad. If you have some little money that you've already paid taxes on, Nothing stops you from opening a, an account abroad. For Kenyans who have never had no, no, the privilege of experiencing Kenyans. those goodies, what, what are they? Have, I mean, uh, look, at, look at the bones. Look at the, you know, one goodie which is there is that African countries are known to be politically unstable. You know, if you're a hardworking Kenyan and you can get access to good money, you know, by investing abroad, you actually secure yourself from one country deciding to kill you financially because of silly political instability. As a politician, but should you not pass laws to make our country less politically unstable? Let me, yes. let me put it this way. I, like earlier on, I stated clearly that in Kenya, we are making the right steps. We are taking the right steps. There's no way, Maura, today, you can actually come in and take me as a nominee to open an account for you. I search a lot of money. I invest that money. And... I do not declare that you are the beneficiary. You can't do that in this you know, country right now. In this country, you can do that. You know, there's no way you can do that. There's, yeah, no, there's no, way. no way you can do that in this country. So we are taking the right steps. If you look at the EU, there are countries now that have been banned for EU citizens. Those countries are more attractive to Kenyans, like Mauritius is one of them. You know, there's no way as an EU citizen can you do any business or can you have an account in Mauritius without you declaring. So Kenyans are rushing there. Our legal minds here are opening companies for Kenyans abroad, you know? So really, I think what we need to do now is for us to develop regulations. Still following the Companies Act, we can amend Section 93 of the Companies Act, you know, uh, I think uh, Section so Company Act 2015. Are you saying, and I need to keep this short, do you agree that we should amend the law? That we can this? amend the law okay. and come specifically with regulation that deals with offshore investments. Nothing stops us. But as we speak right now, no, there's nothing illegal with that. I heard about the secrecy, you know. I mean, and complexity. And the complexity. So what? If I can afford. I am not stealing your money. If I've not stolen your money and I can afford to be able to hire a lawyer who can then be able to make sure that when I'm gone, my family can be able to benefit from that money, you know, I shouldn't be crucified for that. I don't make this a one-on-one. -on -one. Let me allow Francis to come in. Francis, <laughs> what's your response? But I know a section of Kenyans may be asking this evening if, if it's so lucrative abroad. Why are we going to, if, if anyone has money in this country, you'll just simply ship it out and a time may come when we have no money in this country for, for, for daily consumption. Yeah, and, and this is where um, those within the tax justice uh, um, uh, networks uh, or, uh, or campaigners or activists uh, usually uh, get problems with uh, some of the proposals that people have, uh, that it is okay for you to open an account out there, that it is okay for you to move your money out there. If you look at the kind of countries that money is moving away from, it is the countries that actually need this money most. If you look at the people that are involved in moving this money out, it is the people who are well connected, it is the people who hold a certain kind of political clout, it is the kind of people that are able to obtain the best legal minds. And in addition to that, it is important to point out that some of the money that goes out is actually illicit, illicitly obtained. This is the proceeds of corruption, it is money that is obtained from the trafficking of ivory. If you look at the list of people that are named, that are named uh, in the Pandora leaks, and you connect that to the Panama leaks, some of them are clean, some of them are in business, some of them are politicians, but you will see others that are involved in very shadowy businesses. And I think there is something there that should shock our consciences and say, if there is an international uh, financial system that allows others, uh, who, people who are clean, to commingle their money with others that are dirty. And both of them to get uh, you know, the advantages of secrecy 
uh, the advantage of not being able to pay tax for the money they, uh, they earn. I think that is something we should be angry about. Lastly, I want to say if profits are made in a developing country, our stand within the tax justice movement, movements are, let that money be left in that economy. That is the only way we can grow our economies. But if we are making profits here, and shifting these profits to tax havens, countries that are well developed, I think there's a big problem with that. And I think uh, the contribution of uh, uh, what we see now today uh, from the Pandora leaks, I think shows us that we need to do something about it. We need to stem the tide. We need to bring back the money. Sheila, um, uh, there's an article that you wrote today uh, in response to, of course, the Pandora leaks as well. And you referenced a little bit about why we need to relook at uh, Article 76.2, which prohibits a state officer from maintaining a bank account outside Kenya except in accordance with an act of parliament. Uh, you feel that it's time for us as a country to have a well-defined asset declaration and lifestyle audit system as a strong tool to fight public sector corruption. Talk to us a bit about that. Do you, in a sense, do you feel that what we have is inadequate or has not been properly implemented? Yeah, but first let me just add on to the, the calls on the issues around tax justice and economic justice. Mm -hmm. I think the fact that as a country um, in this continent, we are still over dependent on resources uh, by external development partners. Um, that is really compromising our own commitment um, to, to really pursue socioeconomic development priorities. Um, so for me, the question that we should be asking, even if uh, we continue to allow people to take resources outside, is what does that mean in terms of development? Those resources that are outside, even if they've been legally acquired, even if they've been legally you know, um, moved to those countries, uh, what does it mean for us, for, for Kenyans, you know, that reducing the amount of resources that is circulating within the economy, you know, does that compromise, you know, service delivery? And right now we are struggling as a country, looking at the, the high level of debt, the debt burden is high, cost of living is very high. We continue to experience um, high taxation just two, a few weeks ago, uh, more, more, uh, the cost of fuel has risen. Do we need to put this in context in regard to the amounts of money that are outside? If we have that money inside, what would that mean for our economy? So for me, there's a moral question around it, especially when you see the political elite, who we expect because they're the ones that we have you know, entrusted this country with. If they don't, if they don't trust their own systems, they don't have confidence in their own uh, systems and the financial systems that are you know, uh, leading and, uh, and overseeing. So what does it mean for the rest of Kenya? So there's a question around economic justice and tax justice that we really need to discuss. Even if it is right, um, they have acquired the money lawfully, but then morally, is it okay that they're taking out the, 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 the resources and leaving, and, and leaving Kenyans as trapped? in terms of uh, the amount of money available and also in terms of what it means in terms of service uh, delivery. But back to the question you have asked me in regard to issues around uh, you know, wealth declaration, um, really what, what, what we are saying is that there have been gaps in regard to the implementation of the, of, of the wealth declaration provisions as contained in the Public Officer Ethics Arts Act, specifically Section 26, uh, which really uh, requires all public officers to declare their assets and, and liabilities, you know, including those of their spouses and dependents every two years. But then we've seen that, yes, and, uh, that, that, that has been done. Though I think last year I saw almost um, the, a report that almost 4,000 uh, public officers hadn't, been, hadn't declared their wealth as required and there was supposed to be some action against them. I don't know whether that really happened. But this, it, it, it's actually just routine. You know, you, you fill in your, your wealth declaration forms, you put it in, an, in a brown envelope, and it is in some office somewhere. Even if you yourself, as a person filing, wanted to go get it and retrieve it and check something, it would be so hard to find it. How would you, you know, it's, it's stuck in an office somewhere. I think I only heard of the Teacher Service Commission who once tried to actually uh, put that filing system, have it done electronically. Mm. I do know that they're still oh. doing that. But then it's been quite difficult because then someone files, but then you can't, because there's no public access to this information. So that even if someone wanted to track, even agencies, I wish we could have someone from one of the agencies, even like ESCC, to speak to this, that even if they want to track and retrieve some of those um, reports or declarations that have been made, it is, it is very, very difficult. So it, it would make sense 
if there's access, public access to that information in regard to what has been filed by, by public officers. So that you're actually able to make meaningful use of this information. You know, I look at look at uh, what one person, fi someone filed, you know, when they entered into the pub, when they entered the public service and then track that consequently. You know, after two years, what are they declaring? Does it make sense? Whatever they're de declaring as their assets or liabilities, is it commensurate to what they have said they have been earning? You know, if you're able to do that, then you'll even be able to track and, and, and know when someone is, say, engaging in an unlawful act to be able to earn more income because that has happened. And we've seen those cases where public officers have been taken to court, you know, for unexplained, you know, wealth. But then by the time they're even being taken to court or by the time there are any civil proceedings being instituted, it, it's a bit too late, you know, when money has already uh, been lost. So I think that if, we're, if, we, if, we, if we had a more proactive system and ensure that this, this uh, whatever is declared is publicly accessible and you're able to track then it makes sense. I think the other question that we also have to look at is uh, lifestyle audits, having a framework for lifestyle audits. And here I know the president has spoken very much about it, even in June 28, 2018. He offered himself and the deputy vice president, I mean, deputy president as among the first who would then be subjected to a lifestyle audit. Well, I'm not sure whether that happened, but we do know that um, they, 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 were, they were heads of finance and, uh, and the accounts departments and procurement who had to undergo, you know, the lifestyle audit uh, process, uh, that, that lifestyle audit uh, process. But then again, there was really no um, information back to the public in regard to the outcome of that process and what happened to people who were found to have, you know, unexplained wealth or uh, would have, had used their position, you know, to accumulate wealth and lo unlawfully. So it's okay. about time that we really look into our wealth declaration and, and lifestyle audit framework. We need to have, it needs to be very well defined. Um, because it could, it can be, it can serve as a very mm -hmm. strong tool to fight public sector uh, corruption and abuse of, of power. Sheila, you've taken us down a path that I want us to continue on. Senator, uh, in the words of the president, reports like these will go a long way in enhancing financial transparency and openness. If one report can do so much that presidents around the world are, are, are you know, going public about it, what about public unveiling of wealth declaration forms of public officers? including yourself. How much difference do you think that would make? A big difference, and I have no problem, and I think in Parliament we do that. Every year, uh, I know the Speaker pa comes with a public. list. Okay. You know, yes, the, the, the Speaker comes with a with document. We're supposed to list and declare all our wealth. And uh, you know... So, so how much uh, are you worth? Uh, uh, a lot of money, <laughs> I can tell you that. Because it's it is not static. <laughs> it is not t static, you know. I, I earn money, I save money. And like earlier on, I was telling you, I go where I can be able to maximize on my returns. And one of the things that we have to ensure that we are honest about is that, yes, I know I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. But that should not stop me from investing anywhere that I want to invest, so long as I've acquired that money legally and I can be able to show the source of my wealth. I think the big, the big uh, Pandora uh, box here is that a lot of people want to know where did you get that money. People believe that when you become a public officer, you have access to free money lying there. You don't. You have to work hard for you to be able to get that money. Well, not so I think, has said I think just to get to a point, what she was saying, I, I would support that at any given time. Because I always ask myself, yes, I fill the forms. What next? You know, I would like to see a situation where we have a database where anyone can go in and key in and say, how much did Ledam Olekina have before he became a senator, and how much does he have now? How much did President Uhuru Kenyatta, how much was he worth before he became president, and, also, and how much is he worth now? Taking into consideration his own personal declaration. And I think the biggest mischief here, which we have to clear, is that when this report came out, I did not see anywhere that says President Uhuru Kenyatta has you know, decided to invest abroad, take all the money that he has earned in Kenya abroad. In fact, the only thing that I could see there was that he's a beneficiary. You know, in the event that uh, you know, uh, the Lord decides to call the mother, he can be able to end up get, you know, being the beneficiary, the owner of those properties. Nothing is illegal there. You know? We all bequeath this world to the younger generation. The mother is doing that. You know, and if I have my children, I have my children in Kenya, I have my children in the US, 
whatever properties I own here or whatever property I own in the U.S., I put it in my will and I say this belongs to my children. Let, There's let nothing Dama, really Dama, A section of Kenyans would ask if 10 billionaires in this country invest half, three quarters of their fortune abroad, what will be left? What do you mean? This economy? And I ask you this no, because no, I, I, want to understand I know your neighbors, I know some, na some, some of our neighboring countries in the Horn of Africa, ETC, who restrict, actually limit some of those remittances. They want as much of the money to stay in the economy. Is that an approach I would we want, should begin to think about? I want a lot of money to stay in Kenya. You know, I want to be able to reduce the interest rate in this country. I'm against the dumping of all vehicles in this country. But if me owning a new car, I have to invest abroad because the interest that I get here is not good enough, so be it. So long as that money, I can be able to tell you, I got this money by selling 10 of my cows, here's the money. Nothing stopped me from doing that. I would encourage people to be able to reinvest money that they earn here in Kenya, but any money they earn abroad, they have a choice to do so. They have a choice to invest abroad or to bring that money into the country. We should not force people to actually want to run away from this country. Sometimes we have to be very careful with the kind of laws that we develop because you might develop laws that will encourage so, so you people it, okay. to become more, you know, uh, averse to investing abroad than here in this country. Francis, yeah. come in. And, I, I and you are, in. as you are, you know, part of this expose, did, did some of the uh, circumstances and situation scenarios that he talked about come up uh, as you looked at various individuals and, and, and some of their um, uh, sources of wealth abroad? Yeah, uh, part of what this expose has not done is look at how people derived their money. And uh, basically because what it sought to do was shed light on where the money was and who was holding it and how it was being hidden. And I guess authorities, There's, police can then now go and do their work. You ex know? Exactly, because the, 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 the duty of policing the duty of implementing laws that bring back wealth is actually a national function. It is the government of Kenya, through its uh, several agencies, that is supposed now to take over the role of ensuring that if wealth was made illegally, we know, because now we know where the wealth is, and if it needs to come back to the country, it be brought back. But I want to add a few things there. That uh, if, if, if you are a politician in charge of a country, I think there's a big issue, even if not uh, legally, but morally. If you're making the money in that country, you hiding that money in another system or in another country, I think there's a problem uh, there for me. Because it means, number one, you don't even trust the systems that you are in charge of. But secondly, I want to say that uh, we, we do not fight that people have the responsibility and the leeway to do whatever they want with their wealth. But I think there is something wrong and it is important for us to clarify here that behind all these uh, we are talking about here, the Pandora, uh, Pandora leak or the Pandora box, I think there are victims. There are hospitals that could have been built. There are roads that could have been have built. Uh, there are issues that this country needs to address that could have been addressed if some of this wealth was within our country. In fact, not just for Kenya, but several other countries, not just within Africa, but globally. <laughs> but globally. I completely disagree because and yet you want the interest I'm rates not, down. I'm not you. using my personal money to build a public road. You know the way they are creating a hula baloo. It's a sieve. It is the exchequer money that is being hidden abroad. Uh, uh, we, have, actually, we have to uh, demystify that. The economy that. is one. Is, no, no. Is, we have to demystify that because Maora, you make your own money. Okay, you are paid your salary. You, I don't expect you to be your brother's keeper such that you go and use your own private money to build a road for them. Your taxes are already being used. If you're talking about hiding taxes, you know, that's a problem I have. If you are talking about hiding taxes, like you're not paying taxes, you're taking the tax you're supposed to pay to Kenya revenue and, dish, and, and hiding it abroad, that's, another, that's a different case. But okay. if it is money you've that you've earned... Him, so I'm also going to interrupt you. If it is money that you've earned... <laughs> yes you have a right to do whatever you want to do with it. Francis? Yeah, though, though, though uh, the Honorable Senator here is saying he's disagreeing with me, he's actually agreeing with me. No. Because he's saying <laughs> that if you're hiding taxes, then he has a problem with that. And this is what we are saying, that the people who operate secret 
ca secret companies out there. There's a reason why they do it. They do not do it because they are happy to do it. They do it because they do it in places where they will pay less tax. They do it in places where they know that their names will not come out publicly. In fact, these uh, leaks have been very clear that indeed if you're looking for information about certain people, their names will come out as numbers. And this is where we are saying that a lot of this wealth, if it has been derived from our country, I think it is fair enough to have it stay within our country. The reason why people do it is because they want to pay less tax. They want to ensure that their wealth can continue for many generations to generations without ever having been taxed. And I think there's a big problem with that. Sheila, should we come to a point as a country where we even cap what you can send outside uh, Kenya? I've seen it in a few other countries. It's, it's controversial. Economists would say it will stifle the growth of your, of your economy because a foreign investor would come in, want to start a business here, but then later on can't send out their profits because of your laws. But there are those who say maybe that's how you can build some of these African countries, including Kenya. I think in terms of enhancing domestic resource mobilization, maybe it is time to have that conversation because I, I totally, as, as Francis has said, that there's that, that whole question of that, those taxes, that little tax that you're paying in that other uh, jurisdiction, you know, um, those fees that you're paying to set up the, those companies, what could they have done here? So as much as, yes, it is your wealth, it is your money, you have a right to, 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 to do whatever you want to do with it and decide how to spend it. But then there's just that moral question of why, 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 leave it, why take it away from this country where it could, have, it could be of utmost benefit. And that's why I said for me, um, um, it, it, when you look at our political, because these reports are touching mostly on, you know, the, the political elites, the oligarchs, the billionaires, and so on. But especially for the political elites, you have been elected into office. You have a high, you know, responsibility in terms of, you know, ensuring the growth of this country. But how do you do it, even if it's your personal wealth? But isn't there that personal responsibility as well? You know, um, that interest to grow your country. You know, instead of taking the those resources out there. So maybe it's a conversation we really need to seriously have in terms of enhancing domestic resource mobilization. Because if we don't, then we'll continue to see capital flight and we'll continue to suffer as a country in terms of socioeconomic development. Sheila, thank you for that. <laughs> we, we need to take a break, but I know I'll also need to release Ledama shortly. So let me allow him to get one thought before we take a break. I'll read a lot of your feedback. I'm seeing your SMSs, and then we'll get a few more thoughts from my guests. Ladama, the, the question of morality versus legality seems to be come. That's where we're getting uh, to think, at the point. And he's, a, he's an activist, so he's speaking from a point of what is the common good of most people, not just the thoughts of an individual billionaire or two. Do you see I that think, perspective? Yes, and I would agree with you. I think that is a question we need to discuss now, the issue of morality versus legality. Because if I were the president, and it is my own money that I'm investing abroad, I would ask myself whether I don't believe in myself as being a leader to be able to create a good country that I can be able to invest in and create more wealth. You're but a if senator, I'm a beneficiary, you're a senator I'm, I'm today. just being hypothetical. Okay, here. I'm saying it to you. But you're a senator in my today case, and you invest abroad. As a senator, I would be very honest. I love to invest in this country. I want to be able to make money in this country. But if I'm a beneficiary, if I have an uncle, if I have a friend who decide to bequeath his wealth to me, I would not say bring it all here because I'll wait to be informed that this is what we intend to do with you. And earlier on I said, it is attractive to be able to invest abroad because there's so many opportunities. You know, even though, even though we, are, we live in a country which is slowly becoming democratic, we should not run away from the idea that in this country, politically, every, every five years when we change the leadership in this country, people are scared. So don't allow a country to make or kill you financially. You know, ensure that you diversify. If it means buying an apartment in Dubai, so long as it is legal, you've used your own money to be able to buy. 98% of Kenyans can't diversify. They don't exactly. have those and, options. And let me tell you. So what do you me, do for the greater be, good of them? Let me be a bit brutal here. You know, sometimes we are, Kenyans, we can be hypocrites. Because if they had the opportunity to do so, they would do it. The what truth, The <laughs> truth is, if you put yourself in my shoes, if I'm in a position to invest abroad, if 
you could be in my position, you would do it. The problem we have in this country is that we me. like, no, 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 no. We, I mean, this is a moral question. And, and, and let us just be very, very honest, mm -hmm. because the truth have got no shades of gray. If you are in my position and you had the salary, as a, as a senator, I'm paid a million shillings a year, a, a month. And then I pay taxes, about 330,000 uh, shillings. I'm left with around 600,000. I pay loans here and there, you know, because I've invested. I take some little money and invest. If I feel like maybe I could take $2,000 and invest in an offshore mutual fund, and I make more profit, why not? Because by the time I come back to seek re-election, you will want me to spend more money. Where do you think I'll get no. that money if I cannot get it in this country? Don't throw it back to us as, as the voters. No, you see, the problem we have, the problem we have with um, um, the media worldwide is that the media like to be sensational. Right now, I can tell you, because I'm also a journalist, and I'm an investigative journalist, I've been in investigating private citizens who own a lot of properties abroad. And if I tell you who they are, you'll be shocked. To, for you what know, aim? Are you, I mean, are you going to release Because us? I want to know whether they have taken any of the public money. If it's public money, then I'll take it to ESCC. So really, you, you have to be, you have, but for them, they will find it interesting to investigate presidents, you know, because of that moral because question that you brought up. Okay, I need to take that break, but Francis, <laughs> you, 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 let, me, let me take it after you say something. Yeah, um, I, I hope the dossier is coming, Senator, uh, very soon, <laughs> so that we know who, who else needs to be named. But let me say something about the Pandora leaks, that this is just the opening page. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Is there, is there more, more coming? There is more coming. It's only that now we are shocked that it is presidents named and very senior people, including people who are in IMF. Can you imagine? But I, want, I also wanted to add something. Though we want to say that people invest out there, this is a fallacy. The truth is, this money goes into mutual funds, and that money still comes back to us in the form of debt. If you look at trends of debt currently within Africa, we are increasingly borrowing from private equity funds. We, are, we have gone to the private funders. Why are we going to private funders? It is them who have the money. Where did they get the money from? The money came from developing countries. How did it get there? It is money that is hidden through complicated corporate structures. So you have a system where we are taking money out of the country, saying that we are investing, but in reality, it still comes back to us in the form of debt, and you find countries that are in a very vicious cycle of debt to finance our schools, our health system, and I think this is where we are saying we need to draw a certain line and say if you're making the money here, please leave it here. You think that's, that's, where, that's where we need to go? <laughs> yes, but secondly, here, it here. Yeah, but secondly, at the international uh, uh, system, we are saying that the international financial system needs to undergo certain changes because though we may amend the Companies Act, there are certain ways that we cannot be able to get those that decide to invest out there. But at the international financial system level, we can be able to change our laws, increase corporate transparency, ensure that people who evade tax here can be able to pay their tax wherever they hide their wealth, so that it is no longer lucrative to hide your wealth. Even if you do it, the international system still catches up with you. Okay, I think it's a good point to take a break. I know Ledama won't be with us when we come back. Senator, are you gonna lobby your colleagues? We need new laws, clearly. I think the only laws we need is for us In to one be word. able to mm. ensure that if you open a company outside the country, you can then be able to file your taxes here, declare how much you've, you've paid abroad, you know, and then see whether there's any need for you to pay any taxes here. Greater transparency. I mean, and I, I advocate for that. I advocate for that. But let us not crucify investments opportunities. Let us not crucify, you know, innovations. Okay. You know, because this, this world is becoming small, you know. In fact, when you talk about investing all the money it in the country, a short no, I let me just I finish this because this is a very important point. Yes. If you're talking about investing all the money in one country, don't forget that you don't live in isolation. You have other countries that you do business with. So develop legislation, but don't deter other investor, investors from investing in your country. Okay. And I was going to say we've lost a lot of money since independence, the, the reports out there. but. 
that's a story for, for another day. We'll have another discussion on that. Let's take that break. When we come back, we still have Sheila Masinda, Executive Director, Transparency International, on the line, together with Francis Cairo, who's a policy officer, Tax Justice Network Africa. Uh, Senator Ledamo Lekina will not be with us on the other side, but I'll read your feedback, get a few more thoughts, and then we wrap it up. You're watching Newsnight. Stay with us. We'll be right back.